Live from the Washington, D.C. area, all empowered citizens need to know about intelligent use of resources, smart governance, inclusive communities, smart industry, and healthy, thriving urbanization. This is Smart Sustainability, the TV talk about shaping a sustainable future in the digital age with Nicolette Stividar. Inclusive communities, there's a lot of talk about it these days, dream or reality. How real are inclusive communities? What's the concept? And what unique role has the United States with all of that in shaping the future? Lots to talk about. Good evening, I'm Nicolette Stividar. By now, you must have heard the words inclusive communities. They represent different things to different people, and there's a wide gap in interpreting whether they exist today or not quite yet, depending on who you ask. So we want to shed some light on the idea of inclusive communities this evening. Look where we are today and where we realistically could be tomorrow. Now, diversity and inclusion as concepts are hitting hard everywhere. They really are coming to the forefront, and you have to ask yourself, why now, more so than ever? Yes, some would say the past years were defining, but not just politically. I think there's more to it. What am I getting at? The essence of diversity and inclusion is one of embracing, acceptance, respect, appreciation, an understanding that something whole is made up of all of its parts, not just some of them, on a personal level, just as on community level. So in a way, it's about love, unconditional love that is, and with that closely linked to our human evolution. So are we evolving as humans? Are we getting closer to grasping what inclusion is? Are we ready to make inclusive communities the new norm? Our guests tonight are the president of NFPPA, the National Forum of Black Public Administrators, an organization to advancing black public leadership in local and state governments. He comes from a city management background, having served as city manager of Missouri City in Texas and assistant city manager of Austin, Anthony Snipes. Also joining us from NFPPA is Marsha Connor. She's executive director of NFPPA, also with a city management background, and joining us is also the Director of Diversity Initiatives at Old Dominion University, Dr. Vileka Gatling. She comes from the education sector and is also an adjunct professor. Welcome all three on Smart Sustainability. Glad to be here. Thank you. So this is a big topic, obviously, inclusive communities. It's a big concept and we do want to dive in. But I want to learn a little bit more about NFPPA, Anthony. Can you give us an overview of what NFBPA does? Sure. Uh, let me first of all thank you, Neglect, for allowing us this opportunity to be here today. Uh, NFBPA has been in existence since 1983, uh, having uh, over 30 plus uh, chapters across the country, uh, impacting uh, not only local and state governments, but partnering with federal entities as well. Uh, we believe it's important uh, to have a voice with public policy. Uh, leadership development. We have two signature uh, executive leadership programs, our Executive Leadership Institute, as well as our National Mentor Program, because we believe it's essential that not only uh, that we uh, make ways for the current public administrators, but we reach back and give young emerging leaders an opportunity. So for us, it's important that we not only remove barriers that are in front of us, but reach back and pull the next generation of leaders uh, forward so that they can have a voice and they can have an impact on cities and communities across the country. So uh, with our 2,500 plus uh, members, uh, we try to make sure that we impact uh, because we're at all levels, uh, local governance uh, and policy in a productive and positive way. Mm -hmm. Now, inclusive communities, Marsha, as I said in the intro, a lot of people and our viewers, they come from all sorts of life, so to speak. It's a broad concept. What is the concept of inclusive communities about? 
Well, I think um, inclusive communities mean that you have a community that represents the people who live within your community. Um, religious views, ethnic views, um, diversity, ideas, and that it's a community that tries to address all the needs of your community. So, uh, yeah, but would you say this is, but you would say in the U.S., for example, you have certain areas where you, or communities where it's more uh, homogeneous, for example. Isn't inclusive communities a little bit a wider approach to that, to shaking it up, so to speak? Well, I think that the approach as we have, uh, our eyes have been opened in 2020 is that we have to represent, I think, a larger number of our minority communities and um, people of color in terms of listening to their voices, making sure they're included in the decision-making process, mm -hmm. whether it's in healthcare, education, or it's actually those who may even fact run local government. Mm -hmm. Vilika, in the education sector, what does inclusive communities look like when you look at it from the education perspective? How do you see it? Um, when we think about the, the education um, sector, um, and I hope that you can hear me well. Um, yes. I was having some intermittent um, connectivity issues. Um, but um, when we think about it in the education setting, uh, much like what Marcia said, we are looking at the um, being welcoming to the diverse uh, communities uh, that we serve um, and the diversity, uh, not just in terms of ethnicity, but also looking at race, looking at uh, values, looking at beliefs, looking at age, um, looking at gender. And so it is being welcoming uh, and making sure that we provide an opportunity where people feel like they belong in a community. Uh, and so inclusive communities are communities where people are asking, how can I help you? Uh, and what does success look like for you um, rather than um, depicting what it is we think success should be. Um, when I think about having an inclusive uh, community, um, I think about the fact that we have to go past the golden rule of treating people the way that we want to be treated, but treating people the way they need to be treated. How will and we that is that, when though? we truly operationalize what it means to be an inclusive community. Yeah. Um, and so we have to take time to listen to what our specific needs are for mm -hmm. the diverse communities that we represent. Yeah. So how would we find out what their needs are? Um, this well, is in terms of um, finding out what their needs are, oftentimes, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Marcia. Yeah, I think we're going to switch. Yeah, it seems no. like you have some internet issues. So, Marcia, since you already took a step, let's go with it. Okay. Well, I think there are different ways that we um, listen to people. I think you have to go where the community members are in their communities. I think we have to look at non-traditional ways of uh, seeking um, ideas from communities, where it's in focus groups, going to the communities, of course, using churches, doing surveys. But um, I think there's various ways of being able to listen to communities. Some communities have had listening sessions, um, whether it's council members going to the community, where we'd say reaching people where they are. Mm -hmm. um, some have had surveys. Um, the other is having focus groups throughout the community or also looking at people who represent uh, different facets of a community, um, mm -hmm. looking toward what we call their, um, their key leaders of a community and making sure that they're engaged in decision making processes. Mm -hmm. Or when you are trying to define what an, an inclusive community is, listening to their voices and making sure that their diverse voices um, at the table when the discussion is being held. Mm -hmm. Now, Anthony, Nicholas. is this different today than it was before? Like even in the last five years, for example? Are people more well, open I, to that? Well, what I would say to you is that there's always been an evolution. Uh, mm -hmm. Communities are becoming even more diverse. Uh, you know, every corner of the, uh, the United States isn't diverse. Uh, communities that were once fairly homogeneous are not that anymore because they are experiencing a large number of new folks coming into their communities that are differently, uh, are different in racially, ethnically, uh, and culturally. And that means mm -hmm. how are you allowing those citizens to be a part of the decision-making process? How are you giving them full access to resources? 
you know, uh, those are the discussions that cities are grappling with. And a lot of times it requires, particularly in areas where you have minor or majority uh, uh, individuals that control resources, et cetera, how do you uh, get them to have a willingness to allow those individuals to be part of decision-making, but more importantly, uh, to understand the, the value and the richness of diversity and inclusion in their community, uh, because if you have those diverse voices, you're better off in the end. Mm -hmm. Let's go on a quick history tour. I, I want to go back a little bit and really see where we started. So can we move back decades? I, depending, I leave this up to you, how far you want to go in terms of where we've been and how we've come along. What were some of the key milestones with that whole concept of diversity and inclusion? I don't know if you've opened it up just up to Anthony, but I'd say for the African American community and minority communities as a whole, I'd say the 1965 Voter Rights Act, which um, basically was passed to make it accessible education, um, hiring practices, voting practices across this country, were probably for African Americans one of the major milestones in terms of feeling that they um, now have a voice or can participate equally in the voting process, be educated like everyone else. Um, that's one I would say in terms of um, probably a, a significant milestone was 1965 voter rights, passing of the Voter Rights Act. Hmm. Vileka, you have something to add? Um, could you repeat the question? I was I was popping back in. I was changing. Yeah. Um, we're, we're going on <laughs> a little history tour here. So we're going back to the actual how how the concept of diversity and inclusion kind of evolved through the decades. Um, so we when we think about, you know, education, you know, Brown versus Brown, mm -hmm. Brown versus Board of Education um, in the late 1950s um, was a huge milestone for um, education. However, um, as we know, even though Supreme Court decision uh, ruled that uh, schools should be um, desegregated, um, mm -hmm. there was still some lag in various communities. Um, but that did begin to uh, spur, and especially in this, in our local community here in, in Norfolk, um, in the Tidewater area, it began to uh, provide opportunities for um, education, educational leaders to see uh, the importance of ensuring that um, there was equal opportunity and access to educational programs. Um, equally, um, we've had uh, reauthorization for uh, students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And um, while that particular legislation took um, shape um, nearly over 50 years ago, it was reauthorized in 2004. Mm -hmm. And so that also began to uh, give um, educators an opportunity to see what they needed to do to uh, make um, opportunities for students within the educational setting more inclusive. Um, you saw um, a little bit more of inclusive settings in uh, the uh, PK-12 era, mm -hmm. um, and you also saw that um, influence also in higher education. Now, from a personal point of view, and this question goes to all three of you, so maybe Anthony wants to start. If you think back from a personal point of view, what was the most poignant turning point for you personally? Well, what I'll say is, you know, we, we talk about uh, the legislation in the 60s, you know, uh, but I think the precursor, although there was a large amount of work that needed to be done, really started in 1863 when we were uh, granted the ability to be free. Uh, because ultimately for so many years on the backs of uh, African American, uh, we assisted in building uh, America. And I think uh, uh, based on the work of uh, Abraham Lincoln and others, um, uh, seeing the importance uh, of uh, f uh, setting slaves free was the start of that journey. And, and from that time to the 1960s, uh, it was important that we understand that it wasn't just being free, but that we had the resources, that we had the support, that we had the education to really move forth and be the best that we can be. So I think uh, collectively, there have been so many different iterations and, and key milestones and legislative milestones that have helped us along the way to get to where we are today. But the journey still uh, is not over. We still have much to do. 
Mm -hmm. So when you look at, for example, schools today, and, and I know here in the Washington area particularly, there are still some areas where I don't know if you could really call it like a, a real integrated, mixed, diverse mm -hmm. school. There are mm -hmm. still schools that I would consider they look pretty much like, you know, more predominantly to a certain demographic or something. Um, where, how do we get the curve on this one going forward? Really? Well, as, as it relates to education, and, and you make a really good point, um, there are still, um, there's still lots of work that needs to be done. Um, there's still lots of conversations that need to be had because even though we've had um, legislative changes, even though we've mm -hmm. had policy changes, um, there still seems to be in many places still a lack of inclusion. Um, and, and attention to inclusion. And so people wonder why, why don't um, students stay in programs uh, that they were, that, that were built to provide them with access to, right? Mm -hmm. And that they have an opportunity to, to achieve in. Well, once they get in programs that have been designed to provide them with an opportunity, they don't feel like they belong there. Um, they, um, they feel like they're just a number. Um, and so I'll give uh, an, an example. So um, in the K-12 world, um, there has been a push for many years to make sure that students have access to advanced courses, mm -hmm. uh, AP courses, higher level courses. Um, however, the access has been provided for them, but in many spaces, students don't feel like they belong in the courses. And so the teachers have not been versed in being culturally competent. And while I am a part of that class, um, as a black or brown student, um, the teacher is not able to determine what it is that I need to be successful in that class. Because what I may need um, as a black and brown student may be something different that someone else needs to be successful. And so what I see now is a disconnect. The opportunities have been provided for, mm -hmm. for black and brown communities, but what is how we get to make sure that they are successful. That's the difference between equity and equality. Um, we oftentimes also see that in education as it relates to retention and recruitment. And so we would get student, we would get um, teachers and faculty members who are of diverse backgrounds, but they oftentimes may not stay in the environment that they're in um, because they don't feel like they're a part of their environment, that their values, that they're the that who they are is being accepted and recognized as an important part of the community. And it's because it's far, um, it's, it's more than the diversity in terms of the how I look. It's mm -hmm. also diverse in terms of my thought. Oftentimes mm -hmm. where we miss the mark is that we hire for diversity, but we don't on, on board for diversity. Yes. Okay. Yes. We hire for diversity, but we don't on board for the difference in the diversity. Yeah, I think that's a huge challenge, which actually brings me to another point. So speaking about um, feeling a belonging in wh where you sort of when, when somebody gets integrated and it gets more inclusive, you feel a belonging. I imagine this to be enormously difficult when you go back in time when they did those first um, tries first, for example, desegregation efforts where you had busing and you would take kids to different schools. It must have been enormously challenging from a management point of view, from a public administrative point of view, but then also from a teacher point of view. So any of you, Anthony, you want to take a stab at this? Well, although I'm not the educator uh, on this panel, I would say that uh, anytime change occurs, it's always dif uh, difficult. And I can tell you uh, whether uh, in Little Rock and uh, uh, those uh, Alabama, when a large amount of those forced integrations occurred, um, I, I'm, uh, uh, sometimes, unfortunately, uh, the legislative bodies or the leaders were the ones that were defiant uh, of the law. Um, mm -hmm. The governor in Alabama uh, stating uh, he would not enforce the law. Uh, those are challenging times, uh, but to me, I think it's important whether you're a city manager, you're a governor, you're a mayor, uh, that you have to hear the voices, the diverse voices of the people. Uh, and I think those, those experiences that um, 
occurred back then were difficult for administrators to implement. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we are tasked with doing the hard, the hard work, the difficult task. Mm -hmm. And with that, uh, it takes strong leaders that have a, a true moral compass um, that are ethically bound to do the right thing in spite of um, what uh, some folks that may be their best friends feel is what should be done. We know that we need to follow the law and we have to also do what's right. I'm, I'm of the belief that a diversity of uh, voices, mixed voices, brings about better discussions, it brings about better decisions, and it brings about better outcomes for everyone involved. But it's important, it's important that leadership steps up and stands tall uh, to, to lead us in where we need to be. Mm -hmm. uh, Nicolette, this is Marcia. I was going to say, as a child of um, integration, uh, which I first experienced in middle school, um, I think that one of the things that we have always had to do is to make sure that you understood that your voice was heard. Mm -hmm. and that you um, communities created opportunities for voices to be heard, whether mm -hmm. you were the first city manager or the first assistant, you had a responsibility to make sure that while you're at the table that you are representing your community um, in a balanced way, but that you had a voice where otherwise a voice may not have been at that table. And so I think the importance of having diverse city managers, assistant managers, school superintendents mm -hmm. is the issue that you have an opportunity from a different perspective to understand where that black and brown student is coming from. And you have a responsibility to make sure that curriculums, mm -hmm. that city, city laws, are open, that they don't necessarily disadvantage others in terms of the opportunity for their voices to be heard or be able to participate in um, what we call open government and also where services are in fact being provided. Um, I think you have to go beyond just um, passing a law that it affects everyone, but mm -hmm. also being able to look at how others can be impacted or how it can be interpreted. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting point. I'm going to ask you, do you think African Americans generally have a more, a, a better understanding of the need of having their voices heard? And, and let me explain why I'm getting to this, because so I'm, I'm European, I'm German. I grew up in West Germany, there was East Germany. So when we did the unification of our country, we noticed there was a difference between the Eastern Germans normally understood really well that you have a responsibility to have to, to make your voice heard because they didn't have a voice for so long mm -hmm. versus the Western Germans. You know, we, the Western Germans were much more complacent about this. So mm -hmm. it's just, it's a different, you come from a different level of understanding. And I'm just picking up on this as, as Marsha, you, you just said this. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering is, and I've heard other African Americans also say that it's really important that your voice is being heard. So, is, can we generally say, and I don't like to stereotype, but I am picking up on this on this one. So can we say that, it's, is it fair to say there is definitely a greater sensitivity of having your voice being heard? Well, I would say, I think Anthony painted the picture from a historical perspective. Um, even when, uh, the and I, I heard Valika say, you've had Supreme Court decisions being made, you had a Voter Rights Act being passed, and yet and still, even in 2020, even we saw in our election, there is still the opportunity to depress the vote. Mm -hmm. There is still, mm -hmm. when we look at African-American students, and they're being educated, we still have a higher number of those who are not passing um, exams, moving on to high school. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is a history there mm -hmm. of not mm -hmm. being heard or in some ways being treated differently or not being provided the same opportunities as others. Mm -hmm. And so you really become aware of it. Right. Um, I think that even um, elementary school kids and middle school kids recognize that there is a difference. But we do have have a rich history, however, of speaking out, whether it was speaking out in slavery through abolitionists, whether it was through civil rights movement, where you had congressmen, you had Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. you had Rosa Parks, and it continues even in the 20s, uh, in 2020 and 2021, as we look at our youth still speaking out. The mm -hmm. 
the issue is the opportunity to um, have the opportunity to have a fighting chance at equality. Mm -hmm. And the definition of equality, I think, changes in terms of the bar, in terms of what that is, mm -hmm. whether uh, you are a student, you're educated, or even in cities where city managers are hired. Mm -hmm. I think what people really want is the opportunity to have equality. It is interesting, I'll just say that uh, during this journey, uh, different individuals have found different ways to mm -hmm. include themselves in the community. Uh, right. Whether that, from a nonviolent standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, looking at things economically, impacting the person's dollar. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you, you, when you look at this journey, there are so many different ways people have ensured to make sure that you understood where they were coming from. Uh, Rosa Parks, uh, the, the, the position that she made uh, in that bus that day was not only just for her, but it was for others and it, it ignited uh, so much uh, going forward. So when you think of the various voices uh, down through the years, um, mm -hmm. it's been varied, but more importantly, it was a cry out to say, listen to me, I, mm -hmm. my voice matters. I want to be included in this community and a lot of times that cry was to the folks who controlled the resources, controlled the dollars, controlled the legislation, and ultimately, un uh, until they were able to understand uh, consciously that mm -hmm. we can do better, those are the mm -hmm. times, uh, that's the time when we start making progress to make change. Mm -hmm. Vilika, you have something to add? Um, yes, and, and to your point um, earlier, I know we shared an earlier conversation as it yeah. relates to, um, you know, none of us, none of our, none of our cultures are monolithic, right? We're all bound by geographic regions too. There are certain things that African Americans um, would would think about and do in more southern states than they are in northern states, right? And we could talk about that. Mm -hmm. And even within, you know, the confines of of the state, you know, as you talked about with Germany, you know, there are things in Central Virginia that are different than down here where we are in in the beach, right? And so, but I think that what's important is that we. Um, we, we have to, in our, our communities, assess our current reality um, as it relates to making sure that we are paying attention to the voices of difference. And so what are you doing? Um, as, Anthony, as Anthony said, um, lots of people have in this current space determined what they were going to do, how they were going to step in and um, ensure that that social justice took place or how they were going to step in and show up differently so that they would honor um, the difference um, mm -hmm. in, in ensuring that inclusivity took place. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that um, my dad reminds me um, of all the time is, and he was, he will be 95 this year uh, <laughs> in April, and he was the first African-American um, principal to integrate, um, to become a principal following uh, massive resistance. And he always reminds me that during that time, as he looks back on probably what could have been done better in that space was the preparation. Mm -hmm. Similarly to the preparation that um, Rosa Parks that the Norfolk 17 got before they entered um, the steps of Norview High School or the steps of Granby High School. Um, they were talked to and they were trained um, in churches about how to make sure when you got to the steps of school, you know, what you would see, what would happen. And he said that he feels like that was a missed opportunity to prepare and I feel like in this time of COVID where we've um, been, many of us have been teleworking, we've been reading things, we've been watching Netflix series that we probably wouldn't have never watched. Mm -hmm. We've been talking to people. We've moved from exposure to now we're trying to be able to experience things and educate ourselves. That back then we missed an opportunity to assess our current reality, to have these conversations and to venture, right? It was. The policy was enacted. This is the practice. Let's go. Yep. But it was like, how did you prepare your heart and your mind and your body and your That's spirit true. for that? Right? Yeah. Because I, I it happens it to on more levels. To improve something. I'm yeah. like, if I'm trying to diet, if I know I have Oreos in my cupboard and, and potato <laughs> chips, I, that's not going to go well for me. <laughs> and so you've got to prepare for it. You know, mm -hmm. you've got to assess your current reality and capacity because I think everybody on this 
this um, panel today can attest to someone coming to them and saying, hmm, I probably shouldn't have said that that way. <laughs> You know, uh, Marsha, you think that there's another way I should? So you have to assess your current reality. And so I think in this space, at least what I've observed is that there are people who are willing now to say, wait a minute, before I make this policy or before I think about what the next thing that we need to do, before I apply this equity lens, mm -hmm. what is my current reality to have this conversation? What do I know about this situation? before I enter into decision making. So I think that's something that we, we're doing a better job at, but we have to keep having those conversations. Yeah, because I think the conversation is kind of what opened all the floodgates that we're learning that we need to talk about these things yeah, and yeah. not hide behind laws or behind some rules that kind of serve as almost like just a cover up, you know, where you can then just duck and stop the conversation. Mm -hmm. But. It, I, I want to go back to the beginning of NFPPA in that respect. So I don't know if this is Anthony or Marsha, one of you two, whoever wants to, rep wants to answer or take the question. When you started or when, when black public administrators became more prevalent in city management, for example, that must have been almost like how should I put this, night and day when you suddenly come into a, a city where you have more people that kind of don't see maybe the need of asking everybody else in that community because it was more like a, like a modus operandi that was more like, okay, this is what we have and everybody operates the same level. Suddenly you have people in there who say, wait a minute, but we need to listen to different voices. Maybe people see it differently and things like that. Can you share any experiences of that you know of or through some of your members or personally when NFPPA started? I will, yeah, I'll probably, um, well, having been, I guess, a graduate student at the time when, and when NFPPA started, I think it was really an outgrowth of the need to promote uh, the need for more city managers across this country to be hired, not only to be hired, but to be supported. And the organization, through its leadership development, one of its goals was to assist in developing the next generation of city managers, of mm -hmm. assistant city managers. And at the time, there were probably a handful of those um, in Richmond, uh, Virginia, Miami, Florida. Uh, Dade County had a deputy county manager by the name of um, Dewey Knight. So there were a few of them, um, Berkeley, you'll read about in the PM Magazine, Cy Murray and Inkster, but that was in the late 70s, early 80s. The numbers were probably um, not as great as they are now. Mm -hmm. And the feeling there was trying to find an organization where people looked like you, thought like you, and could be supportive of you, and where you could in fact share your challenges and, um, your leadership in terms of this group of individuals you were preparing to maybe be the city managers of the next generation of cities. Mm -hmm. And so I think while um, what I observed was they were always members of ICMA because they wanted to be a part <clears throat> of something of their uh, counterparts and their um, other city managers, but they also saw NFBPA as a place where they could go and people who were challenged with some of the same things that they were challenged with, they could have those open discussions. They could support each other. They could learn from some of the things that they may have had to experience. And that was one of the core reasons of starting NFBPA, mm -hmm. uh, mainly because they felt that their counterparts didn't quite understand the challenge mm -hmm. or the things that they were um, feeling. There were many, I, I've heard stories as recently um, as a week ago, where in some cities you have hired diverse a diverse manager, a manager of color or African-American manager, but the community was not ready for it. Mm -hmm. And so they made that leadership, that leading the community very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And so you wanted to go to a place where you could experience a colleague who may be having that, have had that same challenge. So mm -hmm. I think that was one of the reasons why we actually saw in a BPA. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad to say that in 2020, we have through our executive leadership 
Institute through our mentoring program, we have brought through there um, at least 500, 600 um, individuals who've gone on to be department directors, city managers, assistant managers across this country. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put Anthony on the spot because he came through Executive Leadership Institute with a group of <laughs> promising African-American men and women. And all of them in that class, a core group, city manager of Charlotte, city manager of Dallas, city manager of Missouri City, city manager of Petersburg, Virginia, county manager of Baltimore County. So clearly um, they have been supported. Um, they have colleagues around the country. We can now call on some of our founders and, and ask, well, what was it like for you? And they paved the road, I'd say, for that new generation of African-American leaders. What were the primary two challenges that most of your members shared at the beginning? You mentioned already one, which was the community wasn't ready. Was there another one that was kind of like, like a red thread that was, was going through? Well, I would say that there's always been this belief that African-Americans ought to be city managers where their cities where the majority were African-American. So you would look across the country and they would only hire, there were certain cities that would not hire an African-American city manager, would not consider it. Actually, among the group, they would talk and say, wow, I just don't think they're going to be hiring African-American city managers. So people would not apply. I mean, it was just like this unwritten rule of uh, communities that, that they felt were not welcoming. Um, and that was a challenge. And I'd say today we've come a long way um, mm -hmm. in terms of there are many city managers that are city managers of, of uh, majority uh, cities that are not black and brown communities. So mm -hmm. um, and I think that has um, that, that has been probably one of the largest changes. Um, but there were some who did break through and had the opportunity to uh, be city manager. Who would have thought Howard Gary would be the first person of color, African-American, to be city manager of Miami, Florida, which clearly did not have a majority African-American community. Um, so I think even then there were opportunities, but it had to be a community of council members who were courageous, who were willing to accept um, people of color, African-Americans to come in and be leaders and saw them not necessarily because of their color, but the experience that they brought to the table, the education that they brought to the table on um, the other cities that they had worked in. And many of them had worked in multiple cities across the country before they became city managers or county managers. Where are we today? Where are we today? And then some of the unique characteristics or, or general characteristics of an inclusive community that we would define in going forward. What I would say is, you know, where are we today? Uh, I think we are working prog uh, progress. Mm -hmm. uh, we have made strides in so many parts of our, uh, our country and so many different communities, but we still have a ways to go. And I think uh, the key for us is success stories. When we find city managers who have led, uh, particularly minority uh, public administrators who have done an outstanding job and people can see the success of their, their work and, and their team's work. Uh, I think a lot of times, you know, we have to make sure that we have visionary community leaders who spark the effort to say, we can do better. Because in these days, having uh, individuals uh, that understand and, and value diversity in their communities is a great thing. Mm -hmm. The question becomes, is your community there yet? And I think mm -hmm. in some communities, uh, I was reading an article uh, probably a year ago in the state of Georgia, North Do uh, Georgia, where individuals said, not in my, not in my backyard, not in my city, right. uh, when she uh, uh, alluded to the fact that an African American couldn't be uh, in, tw in 2020 could be the city manager or the leader in my community. We have work to do, but I think we have so many up and coming generational leaders uh, with our uh, next generation of leaders who are willing and willing, willing and able uh, to contribute uh, and to make a difference and are not afraid to go to areas that may not be majority minority to say, I'm here and I can make this city better we can make the city better if we work collaboratively as one. Mm -hmm. So is there still a trust issue with all of this? 
a trust issue in having an African-American leader? Is there a trust issue in how they would approach a problem? What's, what's the holdup? Well, I'm, I'm going to turn that around just a little bit and say that in 2020, 2021, we've actually seen promise. And if nothing else has happened out of the discussion of the Black Lives Matter, um, the police um, reimagining, um, we've seen voices that don't look just like us who've said, mm -hmm. we have to be a little more conscious about what we do. You know, I have heard and we've been contacted by cities that are saying, look, we want to take an, a DE&I approach on our programming and the services we provide. We want to take a look at ourselves as a community to see what we can do to better be, um, be open to diversity. Mm -hmm. um, we just got contacted by another city in Michigan. And one of the tools that they put together is a diversity um, recruitment tool. How do we use this tool to know that we are, in fact, purposely doing outreach that is diverse? And, you know, those are things I think 10 or 15 years ago, we probably wouldn't have had the discussion or no one would have thought about it as a tool in terms of attracting diversity. So I think that um, we are seeing conversations that are being open. We are seeing councils that are basically saying, you know, we need to do different. We need to hear people in our community. One of the things that I was struck by, and um, Anthony is our president, we had a listening session across the country with our members. And I was just struck by the opportunity that uh, many cities that were not min uh, majority minority communities allowed their employees to open up and talk about diversity and what it meant to them and what they were seeing across the country in terms of the changes or the lack of changes or the marches and why they were necessary. And to me, that gave me hope that there were city managers and mayors that didn't look like me who, who then said to them, you know what, this is an issue our community needs to embrace. If we're gonna be that model city, that city that embraces what we say and our values, then we have to look at ourselves. And I think we have seen over and over, um, we've seen an increase, I'd say, Valika, in um, creating positions of diversity and inclusion as an attempt to be able to say, we need to open ourselves up to what we can do in terms of looking at our hiring practices, our promotion practices, um, how we are serving our communities. And I think that COVID has also raised that issue issue where we see a community that's disenfranchised because of health care. Mm -hmm. Why are we not reaching these communities? What is the issue about the manner in which they receive health care? So I'm going to say I see hope. Um, I don't think that we have reached what we call the ideal state, but I think there has been lots of opportunity. And like Anthony has said, the opportunity to still move forward and to make our cities more inclusive. I just think what has happened is that people are willing now to perhaps take that risk that they may not have taken before in mm -hmm. terms of looking at their communities, looking at the, the way they're providing services, looking internally to make sure that they're seen as a community that's inclusive and, um, and, but, and has one, equity. But you, but and one of the things I would say, Nicolette, if yeah. I can, um, and, and this that is not only just applicable to the public sector, but the private sector. Mm -hmm. Different perspectives, I think, are valuable. And while communities, cities, counties, may, uh, uh, some of those communities may feel more comfortable working with individuals who share uh, a similar background or have similar opinions, I think they are more and more understanding that collaborate with people who don't look like them, who talk, don't talk like them, uh, can stretch them to think more critically mm -hmm. and creatively uh, to uh, bring about solutions. And I think for me, uh, an example in 2020, when all the things that were going on with the social unrest around the country, uh, uh, Minneapolis, the city of Minneapolis, its mayor stepped up uh, in a visionary and leadership driven way to say, we need to hear the voices from all corners of the community. Uh, not just the ones that are always the loudest and always the ones that show up, but the ones that we never hear from. Let's bring them together to look at reform. Let's bring them together to see what we can do better. We can do better, but how can we do better? 
uh, and we don't want to do it in the silo. When you have leaders that are like that, mm -hmm. uh, I think we can make uh, inroads to be an inclusive community, uh, to make communities better than they've ever been before. Mm -hmm. But it's, it starts with the leader having a visionary thought to say, we need to bring the voices together. Uh, so we can be impacted. Yeah, and that's really interesting because there's plenty, I mean, you mentioned the private sector also, there's plenty of studies out there. We all know that diverse companies actually produce a heck of a lot of better than all the other companies. In fact, we had a show on the link between diversity and sustainability showing that Innovation. diversity is in the very fabric of the planet itself. So the idea that we would not have diversity is really, mm -hmm kind of a sick concept and we got to call it out for what it is because it is a sick concept. It's not wholeness. If you look at something from a whole perspective, it includes every part. But the thing is, why are we still struggling with this? And I think a lot of this also has to do with language. So I want to fast forward a little bit. Velika, what are key characteristics of diversity or inclusion that you could sum up for our audience on a broader level when you ask somebody what's diversity what do you think people should think of or name of like two or three key points um in terms of um in terms of, of moving forward yes okay what is it you um, want people to think of like three things about diversity what do you want them to have in their head well, the first thing is I, I need for everyone to take a step back and, and assess their current reality and capacity mm -hmm. to ensure diversity, inclusion, and equity. Um, it's one thing to provide, and, and it's wonderful. I mean, I think my LinkedIn has a new um, position on it every week, um, Marsha, to your point, um, as it relates to diversity and equity and inclusion um, spaces. But um, some of those positions have been created and, but they have not been created with uh, resources and they have not been created with the person who ha is able to be the influencer in the company to be able to make change. And that's not just in companies, it's also in school division. So it's assess your current reality and capacity to even do what it is that you think that you need to do. And I'll give an example um, that, that mirrors uh, what, what um, my colleagues were just talking about in terms of having more um, black and brown administrators and teachers in, in the workforce. And we oftentimes take our cues from the business world in education in terms of organizational development and how we do some things. Um, I remember way back in the day, it was total quality management, but, um, <laughs> you, but there's a disconnect, but we don't, uh, one of the things that we don't do really well is once we do secure um, people of color in, in various positions, we don't provide them the support. So we don't have the employee resource groups. We don't have the very robust training groups where they can be, have that safe space to be able to talk, right? So we've got to get better at that. And again, that goes back to assessing your current reality to be able to do it. Because if you haven't done it before, you don't have a structure, then you're not sure how you can have it to do it. The second thing is to focus on quality and not quantity. And, and when I say that, that you're not going to get everybody in every uh, swooping swoop of um, presentation that you do as it relates to diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. no, no one's going to run out and say, oh my gosh, I realized that I've just been doing this all wrong. But there will be some people who say, well, you know what? Everybody can't do everything, but everybody's got to do something. And I'm just going to change this one practice. or I'm going to focus on this one thing that I heard that that this was a microaggression. I need to pay attention to this. So focus on quality and not and not quantity in this space. And the last one is to continue to create opportunities for bold, inclusive conversations. Create that space, create those norms, create those structures where people feel like I can come and say, you know, um, you know, my assumption about this used to be this, but now that I've read um, that, you know, this is different for me now. And to realize it's developmental. Everybody has a different entry point into the conversation mm -hmm. and we have to give each other grace in it and realize that my perspective is not the perspective of somebody else, but take the time to create the space to have the conversation. So assess your current reality, Mm -hmm. and your capacity to engage in DEI work, mm -hmm. realize that 
it's quality over quantity and create those opportunities to have bold and inclusive conversations. There are people who are ready to read White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo. There are people who are ready to mm -hmm. read um, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Abram Kinsey, Kinsey, but there are people who are not. They just need a TED Talk. <laughs> they just need one article. Yeah. And you gotta be okay with that because if you, you're like, oh, I'm we doing this training program and we're ready to go. And if they're not that, if they're in polarization, Mm -hmm. They're not ready for Robin D'Angelo yet. Mm. Okay. So they might just need her TED talk. <laughs> so it's a very so. customized opening and yes. learning approach. Yes. Mm -hmm. Depending on what your experience has been and where you come from. Mm -hmm. and, and I actually think this is really important to say because, and that's also for our viewers, because I do think that the United States is really in a unique position to take a leadership role on getting the concept of diversity and inclusion and equity right. And why am I saying that? Because you have, I know for Americans who haven't been out, this is probably harder to understand, but I know for all of those who are foreign born, who are expats, who have lived in different countries, the thing that makes America really unique is that when you come here, everyone can be an American. And this is hard to say about any other country or any other nation that you're out there. It's very difficult. You can, you can live in Germany or in France. You can assimilate as much as you want, but really becoming German or becoming French or becoming a Bangladeshi, for example, is very difficult. Mm -hmm. But what makes America really unique is everyone can become an American. So I feel very strongly that there really is a huge leadership role and potential and this huge pool of different experiences coming together that we can all learn from one another if we overcome that fear factor, that discomfort, if we have the courageous conversations, for example. But I think this is part of where we still have work to do. So let me ask you, Antony and Marsha, what are you doing? What is the NFBPA doing in terms of speeding up the conversation and bumping up people's courage? Well, I think one of the things we've done is uh, we've taken the show on the road. We've, uh, in, in spite of uh, the pandemic, uh, NFBPA has engaged uh, communities across this country. We are collaborating uh, with a number of new partnerships because uh, we realized very quickly uh, NFPPA can't do it alone. Uh, so we, uh, uh, particularly in 2020, ended up establishing close to 15 new MOU partnerships with National League of Cities, ICMA, and others as we started uh, formulating those. And in, in, in the NLC one is in the works right now. How can we work? with them uh, to make sure that that messaging uh, is not just in, uh, domestic, but international about how do we go from here. The bottom line for me is all people have the right to be a part of the decision. Diversity mm -hmm. enriches our lives. And NFPPA has not just most recently, but since 1983, mm -hmm. has worked to provide the toolkit uh, for not only communities, but also the leadership development necessary for our members to be able to be robust in their efforts to, to impact change, but more important, to lead in an effective way in communities across this country. We're going to continue to do that because leadership development, policy development, reaching back and pulling the next generation of leaders who are going to be in those cities, those homogeneous uh, communities of the future, that they're equipped and they're ready uh, to make a difference. Hmm. Marsha, you have something Well, to I add? would say we've also tried to, in terms of equipping everyone with the toolkit, we've created a resource page um, with, for our members, um, which has information across the country in terms of what cities and counties are doing as it, comes, as it relates to DE&I. So I encourage you to go to our website and look at that um, tool. We also had a listening session with African-American uh, city managers when COVID started to um, basically understand what they were challenged with, how we could create uh, development programs, webinars related to it. Um, as Anthony has said, we formed partnerships with other um, 
um, associations. And we've done a number of webinars, whether it's been on disparity of healthcare, overcoming vaccines, um, having discussions about um, ideal police policing. As a part of our public policy forum, we've also had discussions about policing where we brought in police chiefs and sheriffs. And actually, we have another one that's coming up next week that we invite you to uh, register and be a part of it. So what we've tried to do is from a leadership perspective and an education perspective, provide mm -hmm. opportunities for our members to be educated, to understand what other cities are doing and how they might be able to use some of those models in their communities. Mm -hmm. Valika, what would you say to most of us? How would we bump up our courage to get closer to actually become more open to inclusion and inclusive concepts and not tune out when you hear the word? Um, this may sound really simple. Well, there's this activity uh, <laughs> and you can Google it. It's, it's who's in your universe. <laughs> <laughs> it's a litany of questions uh, that, uh, and there's another iteration of it uh, called cultural frame of reference and a bead activity. Mm -hmm. And it's very simple. You you go through and you you uh, answer this set of questions as it relates to, um, you know, who's your who's your doctor, um, you know, what 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 uh, race or ethnicity is your doctor, or it, it has all kinds of questions dealing with your daily life, right, and and what you would do throughout your you know your your day and your weeks and months where you go to do your grocery shopping and everything. And it asks you to think about um, uh, if you had different color beads, you take one bead for your doctor, one bead for your lawyer, one bead where you do your grocery shopping, <laughs> one bead where you worship. Um, lots of questions about your life. If you come up with the same number of beads, there's a problem. Mm. If, you're, if the color of beads is the same, there is a problem. So I, very simple, where you start. Actually, and, and, I love that <laughs> so approach. So you need to be purposeful. <laughs> yes, I love that approach. I do want to actually ask our viewers to try that out and actually see which, yes. with, with what kind yeah. of color beads you would come up. So I think right. that's a fantastic approach to actually see what you kind of have in your environment. We got right. one minute left, and I want to have <laughs> one key word from each of you, please, in terms of what would you want our viewers to take from today's, from today's discussion? I would say that inclusive teams make better decisions, business decisions mm -hmm. uh, uh, across the board and that uh, decisions that are made and executed by a diverse team, I believe mm -hmm. deliver so many more better results based on that. So that, those would be my two takeaways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Marsha? I would say uh, encouraging. Um, it's encouraging to have this conversation. I encourage mm -hmm. others to have it and to continue to be open-minded about the discussion around diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Valika? Everybody can't do everything, but everybody needs to do something. That sounds great. And I really like the beat approach. We'll definitely try this out. <laughs> so thank you, all three of you, for coming on. Thank you very much for watching tonight. I think we all have a lot to learn about diversity and inclusion. And if we all kind of manage to get by that, we really have a very, very bright future ahead. So I would encourage you, if you'd like to learn more about this, you can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com, smartsustainabilitytv, and learn more about that. And we'll see you next week. Have a good night.